So 2 Corinthians 9, starting at verse 6. The point is this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. As it is written, he has distributed freely, he has given to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. For the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but is also overflowing in many thanksgivings to God. By their approval of this service, they will glorify God because of your submission that comes from your confession of the gospel of Christ, and the generosity of your contribution for them and all the others, while they long for you and pray for you, because of the surpassing grace of God upon you. Thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift. So just a little background on this passage here. The Corinthian church here that Paul is writing to, they were collecting money for needy believers in Jerusalem. There was a famine that had hit Jerusalem, and the believers in Jerusalem were were starving even. It was pretty extreme. And so there were churches all around the world that were, or the known world at least, that were collecting money for them so that they could have something to eat and they could survive. And so Paul is encouraging them in that giving. And um, this was actually something that the Corinthians had brought up themselves, that they wanted to do this. It's mentioned in 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Um, But it sounds like they had been really eager to help. So in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, just the previous chapter, it says this, And in this matter I give my judgment, this benefits you who a year ago started not only to do this work, but also to desire to do it. So they, they were eager to do this, and Paul was encouraging that. That made a lot of sense. But in the meantime, there were some false apostles that kind of came up, and they were shaming Paul. They made him look silly and weak, and so then the Corinthians kind of lost heart, They basically said, Paul is, he's basically a picture of weakness. He can't even heal himself. He's a bad speaker. He's not the smartest guy out there. But we, these false apostles, were saying, well, we are really smart. And we have letters of recommendation from Jerusalem. And we can perform these special signs and such. So you should really listen to us instead. So in that, the Corinthians stopped their collection. They stopped collecting for the churches in Jerusalem. They kind of lost heart and lost their loyalty with Paul, and so that collection kind of just lapsed. And so they weren't really doing that anymore. And so 2 Corinthians is really about Paul trying to establish that, among other things, weakness in Christ is actually a strength, and that they should continue the good work that they started. So Paul is strongly encouraging them to follow through on this commitment that they made. And uh, this verse, this passage that we read, is part of that section where he's trying to encourage them to follow through. So he's encouraging them to, to give to the needs of the church in Jerusalem. So let's focus in on verse 8 here. The, the key verse here, I'll just read it one more time. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. So verse 8 has three steps to it here. And number one, God makes grace abound. 
That's kind of the first step in the logic here. God makes grace abound to all of you, he says. Now, what's interesting is that Paul is talking about financial giving, this collection for the people of Jerusalem, but he uses a word that is usually associated with salvation, grace, he says. God's grace is the reason we give. It's that salvation by God's grace that prompts us to be generous and willing to share to help others. So the Father has given the Son, the Son has given His life, and that is our salvation. So there's kind of this chain of giving that starts with the Father going to the Son, going to us, and so we are now invited to continue that. Now you give in kind. It says in the previous chapter, chapter 8, verse 9 here, that for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that by his poverty, you by his poverty might become rich. So Jesus became poor so that you could become rich. This is God's grace to us. God's grace is giving. So Jesus left all heavenly comforts to die for us. It wasn't just a little that he gave up. It was everything that he gave up. If you think about Jesus' life, he, he kind of lived a pretty meager existence. He was born in a stable, and he died penniless and poor, with not even the clothes on his back. Now, even if Jesus had lived, if he had decided to come to earth, and he decided that he was going to have the best life possible... If he was going to live in the best of palaces and have the best of food, have the most luxuries that that time would have been able to afford, even if he would have had that, it still would have been a huge step down. In fact, even a bigger step down than if you and I were to try to live on $2 a day. This, going from heaven to earth to live a moral existence as opposed to in heavenly glory is a step down that I don't think we'll be able to understand until we get to heaven itself. And he gave that up. Now Paul is using this not to try to guilt us or to guilt them. What this shows though, among other things, one of the things that this shows is that Jesus, in giving up that much, shows that all of these material sacrifices are worth it. It's worth it to give, to show grace, to have this love. It's worth it to do it. If God, who knows everything and can do everything, would decide to surrender everything, then it must make sense for us to follow in kind, wouldn't it? I mean, God knows what he's doing, right? We tend to think so, that he's, he's wise, he's intelligent, he knows everything. And if this is how he decides to go about things, then wouldn't it make sense for us to follow in kind? Temporary surrender is worth eternal gain. Jesus shows this in his life, and we are called to follow in kind. So God makes all grace abound to us. Particularly in salvation, but also in material things too. So that number two, we have all sufficiency in everything always. In everything always, even. In in the Greek here, there's all right in a row, three times. So the all things, all times, All sufficiency. There's all, 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 right in a row there. So God's grace makes us sufficient, or if you notice the little number there by sufficiency in your text, in the ESV there, if you go to the bottom it says, or contentment. When God's grace fills us, it enables us to have that contentment or sufficiency so that we are abounding in blessings always. 
And when you have Jesus, you have the ability to be content in any circumstance. Now, I am not an expert on this myself. I had, tend to have the self-pity and, and uh, feel sorry for myself when things don't go exactly as I want them to, as, maybe as much as the next person. But let's listen to somebody who does know what this is about. So this is Paul in Philippians 4, verse 12. And I think I put that on the screen there. He says, I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound in any and every circumstance. I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. And then right after that, he says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So when you have Christ, you have strength and all sufficiency in his grace. So that, according to Paul, whether you are well fed or hungry, you can be content, whatever the circumstances So knowing that God supplies, that our, supplies our needs means that we can be generous. Our, the grace that comes from God reminds us that all these good things come from God. And because of that, because God is our supplier, we can be generous. The one who gives up and surrenders everything gives to us so that we can surrender everything too. So it's not our bank accounts that supply our needs. It's not our credit cards that supply our needs. It's not our investments that supply our needs. It's not our insurance that supplies our needs. If you watch TV at all, you know that there's this mayhem guy that goes around and causes all kinds of trouble. And then it says that all state protects you from mayhem. But it's not all state that protects you from mayhem. It's God who protects you from mayhem. If you think about how many times mayhem could have struck you this past week and didn't, that's not because of all state. It's because of God. God provides. It's God who gives us what we need so that we can be content whatever our circumstances. And Jesus said this Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So when we focus on the work of the Lord, building his kingdom, doing his work, all of these other things that we normally would worry about, they tend to take care of themselves. Well, God takes care of them, but in a manner of speaking, they take care of themselves. So... God's grace abounds to us and so that we have all sufficiency because he is our supplier. And then number three, the third step, so that we would abound in good works, good deeds, doing what is good, what is helpful. So God's grace abounds so that our good works would abound. The word abound is used for both there. God's grace abounds, our good works abound. And it's supposed to be this chain reaction here. So God's love for us and his goodness to us is supposed to motivate our love for others and our good works to others. And the Bible uses this logic not just here in 2 Corinthians, but in other places too. So 1 John 4, 10 and 11. This is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. God loves us, we love one another. 1 John 3, 17, If anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? In other words, if we are not giving in kind then God's love is really not present in us. If God's love is present in us, then we are going to love like God does. We are going to be radically generous and willing to share. We are going to be a blessing to people, even at cost to us. This cadet pledge that the cadets said just a moment ago has this same logic too. 
Look at it up here. Thankful to God for His gifts to me, I pledge myself to be ready to serve God, my parents, my country, my church, my neighbor, and my core. So, thankful to God for His gifts, I pledge myself to be ready to serve. God's gifts, we serve. So, be a blessing. God has blessed us. We bless in kind. Let's look at the uh, screen here and let's answer this together. The eighth commandment is you shall not steal. What does God require of you in this eighth commandment? That I do whatever I can for my neighbor's good, that I treat others as I would like them to treat me, and that I work faithfully so that I may share with those in need. So, we work faithfully, we work hard, we are diligent so that we can share with people who have needs. Be a blessing. God recognized us in our need, particularly, especially in our need of sin for Him. And so we need to respond to the needs of others in kind. Now this economy of God is kind of counterintuitive to human thinking. Let's just admit that. Surrendering everything is not really something that comes natural to us, and we don't really like to do it. Um, and the people who know how to use their possessions in this life tend to uh, not do things this way. If you look around the world at the wealthiest people out there, this is not exactly how they operate. In fact, if you look at statistics, generally speaking, across the country... The poor are more generous than the rich are. In 2011, Americans in the top 20% of income levels contributed on average 1.3% to charity. Those at the bottom 20 donated more than twice that much to charity. 3.2%. Still very low, but on average... The poor give more than the rich do in this country. There's a graph on screen here. Between 2006 and 2012, we had the housing bubble, the recession there. And over that time, between 2006 and 2012, the poor are actually giving more. And the rich are actually giving less, as you can see up there. So, even, there's even this trajectory now where those who have less are actually sharing more. And those who have more are actually sharing less. So if you look at those around us who have more, particularly the, you know, the, the 1% and all of that, um, they, they are not exactly giving stuff away. I mean, they know how to increase their wealth, and this is not how you do it. You don't give stuff away, right? But if you also look at these same numbers here, you find something else. The religious people are more generous. People who are religious are more generous. In fact, one of the reports I found said this. Religious practice is the behavioral variable most consistently associated with generosity. People who are religiously active is the variable that you throw into the numbers that shows generosity the most, most consistently. Those who attend religious services from 27 to 52 times a year give more than those who never attend in both amount and percentage. And I think I have a graph up there too. Charitable effort correlates strongly with religious service attendance, and in particular, evangelical Protestants and Mormons stood out among all of that. Those who volunteer at secular organizations actually are a bit undergiving, Meanwhile, persons who volunteer at religious organizations are dramatically bigger donors of money. The faithful don't just give to religious causes. They are also much more likely to give to secular causes than the non-religious. 
So just by being religious, being religiously active, prompts generosity. Isn't that interesting? When you hear about what God has done for you, and when you hear what Christ has given up in grace to show love, there's something, there's some momentum there that kind of prompts us to show some generosity too. And uh, this is just the financial side of it, but there's a lot of other ways that we could show God's love also. But when God gives to you, it prompts you to give as well. So there's an old saying that I've heard a bunch of times, and you probably have too, it's that we are blessed to be a blessing. This is, this is how, how it works here. We're blessed to be a blessing. Um, just by way of illustration, there's, there's, this is a dam here in China. It's called the Three Gorges Dam. It's the largest dam in the world, and it was just recently... Uh, completed. It took them like 20 years to build this. And um, it, it does a lot of good things, at least from the government standpoint. It generates a lot of electricity and stuff like that. But when you build a dam, there's also some costs that go with it too. Like there's a lot of people who suffer now. So if you hit the screen one more time, you can see on the left there is what the river looked like before the dam. And on the right is what it looks like now. And you can see, if you can see, how much the river has backed up because of that dam there. Lots of people have suffered because of this. In fact, this construction project has submerged 13 cities, 140 towns, and 1,350 villages are now underwater because of this. It's all backed up. And it's led to the forced relocation of 1.4 million people. So they blocked the river, they put a dam there, and now everything is backed up and all these people have to relocate. So God calls us to be rivers where his blessings flow through us and downstream. When you put a dam there, it blocks all of God's blessings and, and yeah, you can get some benefit out of it, but there's a lot of suffering that results too and we're not meant to be dams, we're meant to be rivers. We're blessed to be a blessing. But we are also, in God's economy, counterintuitive to our minds, of course, but in God's economy, we are also blessing to be blessed. We are blessing others so that we will be blessed too. We bless others, we are blessed by God. This is how Jesus showed it, and this is how we're called to live too. The more we sacrifice to show love, the more we become like Christ. The more you're like Christ, the more you are blessed. The more you sacrifice to show love, the more that you share in God's love. The more that you sacrifice and show love, that means the less you'll put your trust in yourself or in your resources, the more you'll trust God, and the more blessings will actually flow through you. We are blessing others to be blessed by God, too. In God's economy, it's a, it's a strange thing how it works, but this is how it works. In God's economy, the more we bless, the more we are blessed. And so, we need to be a blessing, just like Christ was. The more we give, the more we actually receive. Jesus gave up everything he died penniless and in total shame, but that's not where his story ended. He was then glorified and now is at the right hand of the Father in eternal glory forever. When you sacrifice, God rewards it. When you bless, you are blessed too. So be a blessing.
This is how God works, and this is how we are called to work in kind. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Lord, our God, you've blessed us richly, especially with the salvation that we have in Jesus Christ, who gave up everything, surrendered everything, so that he could be one of us, and then surrendered up everything again so that he could die. Uh, Lord, we want to follow his example where he is at the right hand, your right hand in heaven. And so, Lord, we want, to, we want to take this to heart. We want to be generous. We want to give our time, whatever we can, Lord, so that we can be a blessing to those who might have needs. And we pray all things in Jesus' name. Amen.